Hello, my name is Tony Pridmore and for the next 15 minutes I'd like to tell you about some of the work we've been doing at the Computer Vision Lab at the University of Nottingham on convolutional neural net architectures for plant image analysis and phenotyping. So we've been working in this area for quite a while now. When we started around 2007, uh, we were using traditional computer vision and image analysis techniques to address problems in plant phenotyping. So we used expectation maximization and level sets to segment images. We used particle filtering and network snakes to track things through image sequences and sometimes to find the boundaries of objects. Um, we created a number of software tools that we released. These were hard-coded solutions, programs that we'd written, and they took the form of standard, standalone software tools that you would download and run on your machine. Our goal was to make them as automatic as possible, but these are complicated images and difficult tasks. And so in the, in, in the event, we minimized interaction as much as we could. We found that most of our solutions needed some user input to make them useful. All this changed around 2016 when the deep machine learning revolution hit computer vision in general and us as well. And we moved to using convolutional neural nets. So this is a supervised machine learning technique. Instead of writing a program to do the task, what you do in this world is design a learning system that's capable of learning how to do the task. So you kind of stand back and become an architect more than a programmer. The standard workflow shown here, supervised learning means that you train the system with some examples of the inputs and outputs that you want to be linked together. So you capture some images, you annotate the images with the desired output, try, design your network architecture, use your annotated data to train the network, test it and then deploy it. The reason that you do this is that at the end of the day when you deploy, you have something which is fully automatic. Unless you explicitly embed this into an interactive system, these things are fully automatic. All the interaction with the user has already taken place upstream while capturing and annotating the data set and in the training process. The main reason for doing it though is the improved performance. Convolutional neural nets have performed incredibly well on a wide range of tasks in the last few years. Yeah? And they are truly state of the art. So let's look at a couple of the things that we've done with this technology. Um, one thing we worked on for quite a while is the analysis of x-ray images of roots growing in soil. The problem here is we've scanned a soil column containing a root. Um, we have a three-dimensional image of that sample and we need to segment it to identify the root, to separate it from the soil, water, air and so on that's in the, in the column. <coughs> this is a segmentation task and it's the kind of thing that people have used convolutional neural nets for quite successfully in other domains. This is a difficult version of the problem though. When you look at the data you realize very quickly that the gray level distributions of roots, soil, water and air overlap. So a voxel can be the same color whether it is soil, water, air or root. Okay. <laughs> we also found that the color of the root voxels varies along root branches as the, as the material of the root changes. So what this basically means is context is all. You can't look at a single voxel and say this has a gray level of 42, therefore it's root. Okay. What you have to do is take this as an inherently 3D problem, take an area around the voxel and look at that, use that context to determine what's going on at an individual voxel level. The other problem is that the roots are very small and these images are very large and high resolution. So you have a trade-off. To provide the context that you need, you want to access a sizable chunk of the image, but that can be very large and simply too large to be put into a neural network. If, however, you drop the resolution to make your data small, because the roots are so small, the loss of resolution will probably mean that you won't be able to see the root clearly in the low resolution image. So the challenge here is to provide a network with enough context that it can see what's going on, but enough detail that it can see the root in a way that is manageable. So this is a network that we came up with which meets those requirements. It has two branches. To the left hand side you see the input. The input is a cube of data from a, an x-ray CT image and, it, and it's processed differently along the two branches. So along the top we start out with 128 voxel cube of data. 
<coughs> and we shrink it down very quickly so that it's only 16 by 16 by 16. And you see this in the middle of the top um, line. Okay. So along the top line, we have a large area at low resolution being processed. At the, on the bottom line of the network, we have the central area drawn in yellow of the input volume kept to full resolution and processed in a similar way. So these two lines of the neural network are both learning how to do segmentation, one on low resolution data, one on high resolution data. And to the right of the figure, you see a little cross with a circle around it. At that point, these two processing lines come together and the two results are combined. And we produce something which learns to combine those two things okay, to give us our final output. In convolutional neural networks, you insert losses into the network to force the network to learn things at that point. Okay, and you'll see three in this network, L1, L2, and LN. L1 and L2 are there and designed to force the network to do the two segmentation tasks on the two pieces of data separately to the best of its ability. And LN pushes it to learn to give the best combination of them to give the output that we want. So look at some examples. <coughs> On the left, we have the ground truth. This is data that we acquired using our old root track system and some manual segmentation. So this is the, de the desired output from a particular stack. And to the right is what we got when we trained the network and ran the network to begin with. This shows you the other side, the other part of the work that needs to be done when designing these systems. We designed an architecture. We trained it up. It's doing OK. The architecture is clearly right. But what do we need to do to make it perform a little better? Well, we need to train it more. So what we did was we used a technique known as hard negative mining. And in that, all you do is say, find the areas where the network is going wrong and provide more data on those areas to the training system so that it learns to do those things right. And after hard negative mining, this is what we see. <coughs> Another effect of... of CNNs of this approach is that you get something called transfer learning. So to the left of this figure, you see a set of images from our medium CT scanner. This produces fairly high resolution images. Okay? And the output in red is, an, is a uh, root architecture extracted from them. To the right, you see an image from our larger scanner. This will handle much bigger samples, but produces much lower resolution images in both gray level and spatial. So hopefully you can see these are quite different. Having trained a network up on a large number of medium CT images, which we had a lot of, and got a network that can do the basic task, we then took a comparatively small number of scans from a large scanner, yeah, segmented manually, and trained the network up on those additionally, so that it learned to transfer from transfer its knowledge, if you like, from the medium CT to the large CT. So let's look at another example. We built a system uh, a few years ago called RootNav. The task here was a 2D one. We had uh, images of color images of plant roots growing on blue growth paper. So this is hydroponically. And <coughs> what the original RootNav did was segmented those images to separate the blue paper from the whitish root um, and then created a representation of the root system architecture by tracing from the tip of the root system down to the root tip, individual root tips. We attempted to make this fully automatic by designing something that could automatically detect root tips uh, and the seed of the root system, but found that very, very difficult. So the original root nav had a large interactive component. The segmentation was automatic, but the user had to click on uh, or near root tips and so on to guide the system to find them. It then went through a series of uh, tracing steps to go from one to the other and pull out the root architecture. RootNav2 does the same thing, same broad structure, but both the image processing and analysis and the human marking of the root tips is now done by a convolutional neural network, which you see in the top left-hand corner of this diagram. So we have a network that does two things. It does semantic segmentation to separate root from background and also classifies the roots as a first order and second order. And the box marked heat map regression is a technical description for feature detection. 
this will find points in the image which it believes are the root seed and the root tips. After that it goes through the usual root nav approach of selecting features, doing uh, root pathfinding through them, walking across the image to pull up the architecture, storing it in root system market language format and providing it to a viewer. So this is a simplified version of the neural net that we use. It's what's called an encoder-decoder network. Um, it has an image as an input and an image as an output. And in between, the encoder part of the network uh, extracts feature descriptions from the image, a series of those, shrinking the image down so it ends up with a lot of information about a very small image. Then the decoder upsamples and effectively expands the image back out to the original size. So what you see here is on the left, we have one of our blue paper images with the root on it. Yeah. On the right, the output of the system. So here, white pixels are background. Uh, the reddish one is first order root, green is second order root, and you can see the blue root tips on here as well. So what we have here is a network which does two things at once. Right? We believe this is the first use of deep learning to do multitask segmentation and feature localization in plant phenotyping. Again, we use the transfer learning approach. So we had a lot of images of wheat because people had used RootNav1 on wheat a great deal. So we had 3,600 images we could use for training, which was great. <coughs> and the system learned how to do those. We then wanted to, to look at using this on other species and other imaging conditions where the task is fundamentally the same, but the images are quite different. So we uh, use transfer learning to move this across to Arabidopsis, the images you see in the middle. So for this we had 277 images uh, that we marked up, added these into the training set, and transferred the knowledge of wheat into Arabidopsis to get the same kind of results. Now we have a network that can do wheat and Arabidopsis, we'd like to do rapeseed because it's learned more about the task from seeing a wider range of images. It only took 120 images of rapeseed to get similar performance on the images to the right. <coughs> so this is a very different way of working. It's not magic, it's a different way of looking at the problem and a different way of approaching it, and it needs different tools. So you need annotated data, and there are an increasing number of databases out there that will provide it. The ACID database is ours. You also need significant parallel processing resource. This isn't high performance computing in the classic sense. It really means graphics processing units, you know, the parallel processing units that are in most PCs to drive your graphics. Okay. Um, at the moment, you need a few of these for most tasks. So we operate a cluster of 30 plus of these things that we access through the network. Um, people are working all the time to make things uh, run on fewer GPUs, and there are some networks now that are getting close to being able to do useful things on single ones, so you can run them on standard PCs. But at the moment, you, it's better to have more than one GPU around. And what that means is when you come to deploy these systems, it's often better to do it as a web service rather than on a single PC, unless you have a very nice PC. And the tools that you use, the software tools that you use are different. So you use higher level tools like PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so on, to code these things up rather than writing in traditional computer programming languages. So in conclusion then, we've shifted almost entirely to convolutional neural net. They give us improved performance yeah, and fully automatic deployment. We have to do the work elsewhere, but we get those things as a result. They reformulate the design problem. Okay? There is no magic here. Right? We're still doing the work, it's just different work. We have to decide how to learn the task rather than decide how to do it. Okay? And we have to develop new architectures and training regimes to do this. Plant images are different from the things that have been used elsewhere in computer vision. Okay? So you can take um, existing architectures and methods as a starting point, but they usually require some extra work and you use different tools to do it. So that's me finished. I've been the one doing the talking. The people doing the work, uh, Andrew French and Michael Pound particularly, uh, Reza uh, Sultaninajad and Rabael Gasrab were the people who developed the code for the two systems I've shown you. Craig, Darren, Marcus and John helped with gathering the data and training. Around the lab, in general, Aaron Ezenwoko 
Feng and John Attenborough are members of the Vision Lab working in this area. And the work that we've reported here has been funded by UK Research and Innovation and ARPA-E, the US Department of Energy. And with that, I'll be quiet. Thank you for listening.